Are you cool? Do you feel up to it? Are you at ease with yourself, your job, the people around you? Are you comfortable facing the challenges of life? Comfortable. It's an interesting word. Usually etymology doesn't give the meaning, but in this case comfort comes from the Latin cum fortis, which means with strength to face the challenges or to be with fortitude to bear the burdens. And this comfort, what you have. Well, I hope you do. But as we could read, Hezekiah was not comfortable. And most of us are at times without comfort. Because we can be irritated and annoyed, frustrated, angry, maybe even furious. Or we can be disappointed and hurt, down, very sad. Or we can be flustered, overtaken by the events or overwhelmed by problems. And when we are not cool and not comfortable, what do we do? Do we let go and become overwhelmed and drift along? Maybe get sucked into a vortex of darkness and despair with the terror and the pain closing over our head like waters over a drowning man? Or maybe we escape into a different world by drink, drugs, or daydreaming. Daydreaming, leading the life, the secret life of Walter Mitty. Or are we the strong and the struggling lonely hero trying to sort things out by ourselves? When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Being the proverbial man who pulls, and pulls himself from the swamp by his own hair. Well, whatever your situation and whatever your response, the Bible makes clear that you can be either an heroic do-it-yourselfer or a least resistance escapist. Or you can be comfortable with strength, with fortitude, but you cannot be both. And in order to better understand this, we turn to the Old Testament story of King Hezekiah and his people in, Ju in Judah in their predicament and to the Lord's warning to them and his caring for them. So then, let us briefly look at the historical context, because they are not just old stories, but they are real-life situations, like ours. And in our reading in 2 Kings, we are around 700 before Christ. David's dynasty is by then about 300 years old, and there is another 100 years to go, largely of decline, until the end in the exile. And the glory days of David and Solomon are long gone. Judah and Israel are by now peanut states, caught between the then superpowers Egypt in the southwest and the Syria, later Babylonia, in the northeast. And at this time, both are vessels, and they're paying tribute to the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians were a, an extremely cruel and unreliable overlord, even by the standards of the Middle East, skinning alive of some of the people they conquered was one of their practices, to instill fear. And at the death of Tiglat Pileser, a ruling Assyrian king, both Israel and Judah revolted. It was kind of a standard practice of the time. King dies, let's test the new guy, see whether we can get away from them. And it was then logical, of course, to ask to support or receive the encouragement from that other superpower who wanted to fish into troubled waters. And when Hezekiah became king, Israel still existed. But a few years later, the Assyrians have reasserted control 
and they have deported Israel. And there is no more vassal state. In fact, it will never revive as a state. And that happened in 721. And then about 20 years later, about some internal turmoil and turnover of kings, the Assyrians now under King Sennacherib come for Judah. And they have by 701 already conquered all the fortified cities in Judah apart from Jerusalem. And that is where our reading in 2 Kings 18 started. Now you can read in the Bible that Hezekiah was a good king, virtually the last one apart from Josiah. But at times, he wobbled in his trusting the Lord. But then who wouldn't wobble in such circumstances? Because the cruel superpower of Assyria has already overrun the whole country and is coming to Jerusalem. And they can promise 2,000 horses if only Hezekiah could supply the riders and still be certain of winning because he had at least 185,000 soldiers. And in his own annals, Sennacherib had written, I had Hezekiah the Jew locked up in his residence, Jerusalem, like a bird in its cage. And then Hezekiah wobbled again later after Sennacherib had gone with the Babylonian delegation because he probably saw them as the rising superpower behind the Assyrians. And he had wobbled before, seeking support from Egypt, an action that is described and warned again in our text tonight, Isaiah 30, probably happening a few years or a short while before the Sennacherib defeat described in 2 Kings 18. And if we think that we have problems in our life, we can surely sympathize with Hezekiah because he certainly had one, a problem of life and death, because there was a merciless tyrant with an overwhelming power besieging his city. And then we read Sennacherib sends an envoy, the Rapsake, to Hezekiah to demand his surrender. And he does so by asking him, on whom do you depend? Who do you trust for salvation? Egypt? Sennacherib here makes a clear reference to the political alliance that Hezekiah had contemplated. And his assessment of that alliance is actually not dissimilar from Isaiah's in chapter 30, because he says a splintered reed that pierces the hand of the one who leans on it. And Isaiah had said, an alliance not by my spirit, only bringing shame and disgrace. Rahab, it's a nickname for Egypt, yet useless do nothing. Or, do you, Hezekiah, put your trust, if not in Egypt, then in the Lord? And here Sennacherib has two arguments. One is confused. He said, hasn't Hezekiah broken down his altars? Well, of course, Hezekiah had broken down the altars of the idols. And then his second argument is plain wrong. He says, has any of the gods of the people surrounding you been able to resist me? Implication, no. Therefore, do you think that the Lord can? And so, in a way, the Lord uses Sennacherib to confront Hezekiah with the right question. On whom do you depend? Whom do you trust when the going gets tough? Where do you turn? And faced with this urgent reality and this pressing question, Hezekiah makes and confirms his choice after his initial wobble with Egypt. No, not on Egypt, because relying on partners and maneuvering is often a disappointing business. And not on Assyria, and its promises either, because they had already earlier in two kings been broken. But on the Lord. And Hezekiah sends in 2 Kings 19 verse 1 to Isaiah for advice. And he pleads on God's covenant promise when he says, pray for the remnant that survives. 
And he could plead on that covenant promise because the Messiah still had to come. And therefore, Judah could not be eradicated like Israel had been. And the Lord then gives him a very clear and comforting answer through Isaiah in response to his choice and his prayer. The Lord will deal with Sennacherib because he has insulted the Lord. 2 Kings 19.28, because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips and I will turn you back by the way which you came. That is the Lord addressing Sennacherib. But also because the Lord will honor his covenant with Abraham. 2 Kings 19 verse 30. And the remnant which, who have escaped from the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. And because of his covenant with David, promising the Messiah, chapter 19, verse 34. And then we read how the Lord's zeal accomplishes this in the verses 35 to 37. 185,000 soldiers are found there. Imagine waking up a Sennacherib with 185,000 lying dead around you. And he is later killed by his sons. But Isaiah had not just the prophecy against Sennacherib. And this is not just a tense and thrilling story with a happy end. The prophet and behind him the Lord as a message for Israel and for us. And this message, as we read in chapter 30, is a prophetic warning and an encouragement, dating, as we saw, from some time before Hezekiah turned to the Lord and Sennacherib's defeat and demise. Because Hezekiah and Israel had initially tried to solve their problems, the Assyrians, without the Lord through an alliance with Egypt, but with no success. And Isaiah's message to Israel and to us on how in the difficulties and the challenges of this life we can be comfortable, not lose our cool, not panic, but be with fortitude and be with strength. And therefore I would like to summarize the message for you this evening as follows. Comfort follows trust. It's not the other way around. Comfort follows trust. And we note four things briefly. This trust in the Lord is ordered. This trust in the Lord is necessary. This trust in the Lord is always and already answered. And this trust in the Lord is enough. This trust is ordered. It is necessary. It is always and already answered. And it is enough. Well, first then, comfort follows trust, and this trust in the Lord is ordered. Now, the occasions on which the Lord has taught Israel to trust him are numerous. It had already started way back with the testing and Abraham's, in Abraham's waiting for offspring, and then on the events on Mount Moriah. And it had continued when Israel in Exodus had been pursued by the Egyptian army. And formerly, Moses, when hinting at the coming, the coming monarchy, had explicitly said in Deuteronomy 17, also called the king's charter, but he, that is the king, shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, for the Lord has said, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And that shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. So the king in Israel was to be an exemplar 
leading Israel in trusting the Lord by example, not by being a great warrior with lots of horses, and not by being a clever diplomat, making alliances with Egypt and others, often through marriages, and not by wielding economic power, silver and gold. He should lead by trusting the Lord and following his word. And there is a brief but also telling story in Israel's history. It's recorded in two verses, more than 500 years apart. The first one is in Joshua 6, verse 26, where we read, Then Joshua charged them, that is the Israelites at the time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. He shall lay its foundations with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up his, its gates. Now we are here 1400 before Christ, and Jericho was the key entry citadel to the Promised Land. It had been taken without force, and now there was an order not to rebuild the walls, which in military terms was an anomaly, madness, leaving the country open and undefended. But it was to be a permanent reminder that the Lord would protect Israel. And then the second verse comes in 850 before Christ. Ahab, the son of Omri, decided to rebuild the walls of Jericho because Ahab trusted not the Lord but Jezebel and politics. And in his day, that is Ahab's day, Hiel, that was Ahab's contractor, of Bethel built Jericho and he laid his foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and at the cost of his younger son, Segub, he set up its gate according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, no doubt that Hezekiah knew this story. And he also knew Ahab's fate. His blood was licked by the dogs at the pond of Samaria, where the harlots bathed. And he had seen unfolding before his own eyes just a few years earlier what had become of the state that Ahab had wanted to build and protect. It was utterly destroyed, eliminated, eradicated, never to be found again. And then again, while he is pursuing an alliance with Egypt, the Lord once more warns him in this prophecy in this prophecy, in the verses 1 to 5, O oh, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan but not mine, and who make an alliance but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of the Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. The places mentioned a little bit later in the text, Zoan and Hanes, is where the Egyptian politicians and the bureaucrats and the diplomats were living. Slick, smooth and useless. Promising, but not delivering. And then we read in that oracle, in the verses 6 and 7, that it was an arduous road that they were taking. Through a land of trouble and anguish, from where come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the, fly, the fi flying fiery serpent, they carry their riches on the backs of donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels because, of course, they had to bribe the Egyptians to a people that cannot profit them. Egypt's help is worthless, and therefore I called her Rahab, the do-nothing. And this die-and-do-it-yourself solution was hard, we read here. It was costly and it was dangerous, but it was also pointless. And they could and they should have known, because, but they did not listen. That is what we read in the verses 9 to 11. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us the things we want to hear. Prophesy illusions. Get out of the way. And let us not hear any more of the Holy One of Israel. Now these verses, 
may not be what they were actually saying, but they verbalized their real attitude. And so it is always good to carefully listen to what people say, but it is also very good to carefully look at what they actually do. And so we may not be explicitly, literally saying such things, but in, fl in fact display this attitude. Because we do not read regularly God's word, we do not listen to the preaching, and if we are listening, then we are applying it to somebody else. But, says the Lord, this is the order of the sovereign Lord, the ruler and the covenant God, the Holy One of Israel, as it is summarized in a way our text in verse 15. In repentance and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and trust shall be your strength. You have to trust the Lord. And then in the second place, we heard that strength and comfort follows trust, that this trust was ordered, but that the prophet also tells us that this trust in the Lord is necessary. Because trying to find strength and comfort outside the Lord is not only disobedience, it also doesn't work. Trust in the Lord is necessary. The alternatives are ineffective. Ahab had defied the order to rebuild the walls of Jericho. And in rebuilding the walls, he demolished the reminder to trust God and his blood, as you heard. And the northern kingdom that he had wanted to protect without his trust was overrun by the Assyrians. And his people deported all that happened in the sixth year of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah himself, after consorting with Egypt, finds his country in a deadly peril with Sennacherib at the gates, and he can offer him 2,000 horses and still win. And the rest of the land had already been conquered. And Hezekiah's own solution, Egypt, is nowhere to be seen. And it is then and therefore that Isaiah tells him, because he did not listen to the Lord's instruction, this disobedient people from verse 9. In verse 12 and 13, where we read, Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall bulging out and about to collapse, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. Because this perceived wall of safety in Egypt gave no security. It was already cracked and bulging. It is in a way like you can sometimes see in a film where in an artificial lake they blow up the dam. First you see nothing. And then there are a few cracks. And then there is a little bulge. And then suddenly there is a complete collapse and a massive destructive wave. So the solution without trust, as we read in verse 14, is about as useful as a broken pot, a pot of which not a shard is left large enough to take some ashes from the hearth. So Hezekiah's alternative, Egypt, only dust and ashes were left. And the clear warning that trust in God is necessary and that nothing else will work is repeated again in our prophecy in the verses 16 and 17. And you said, no, we will flee upon horses, but therefore you shall not flee away. And we will ride upon swift steeds, but therefore your pursuers shall be swift. And a thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall all flee. Because if you do not trust the Lord, but rely on deals, or on armory, or money, or friends who can pull strings, or equipment, or techniques, you will make the same mistake as it was to rely on Egypt. Israel's kings, according to their charter, were not to rely on horses, alliances, and economic power, but on trusting the Lord. And that is still true for us. At the end of the day, nothing else works. 
And so then in the third place, we have seen that comfort follows trust and that this trust is ordered, that it is necessary. We will in the third place learn that the answer to this trust is a certainty as long as we live. You may not have noticed it, but at the end of verse 15, there is this little sentence, but you were unwilling. It reflects, of course, the reality at the time of Hezekiah. He was then still trying to secure a deal with Egypt without the Lord. And at great expense and difficulties, as we read, and his attempts at self-help were like the road through the desert, a road through the Negev. But it also reflects so often the realities of our own lives. Because how often do we not struggle without trusting or seeking comfort from the Lord and Savior? It is as the old hymn says, and what peace we often forfeit, and what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. But the Lord knows. He knows our weaknesses. And then there is this amazing statement in verse 18. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you, for the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are all those who wait for him. Now this sentence is introduced by the word therefore. Now in our text, the verses 16 and 17 are an elaboration of the you would have none of it, followed by a repeated warning. So the therefore in verse 18 refers back to that little sentence at the end of verse 15. But you were unwilling. Therefore, the Lord waits. Now you may well say, well, that is not very logical. You were unwilling and therefore the Lord waits. If we offer someone assistance or a favor and he or she doesn't take it, we are inclined to say, well, take it or leave it. Or even stronger, if you don't like my help, fine, get stuffed and do it yourself. And we turn away. But our text recognizes that the Lord's offer of help was initially rejected, and yet, therefore, the Lord will wait. And at the end of verse 19, it is even more surprising. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. The logical sequence, of course, is that he hears and then thereafter he will answer. And that is indeed what most translations have. But literally, it says, he has answered. It is a perfect tense. Now, whether one takes this as a prophetic perfect or a normal perfect, the point at the end of the day is the same. God's answer is an absolute certainty. And the logic here is not the logic of our behavior or how we normally do things. It is the logic of God's covenant. It is reflecting the faithfulness of the Lord. Mankind has sinned and turned its back on God, and so often do we. But God took the initiative to restore the relationship. We may fail in our duties, in our part of the bargain, in our life, but God is faithful. And he does not fail. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious. And when we, the drifters, the escapists, the do-it-yourselvers, the lone heroes, when we then finally come, he has already answered. There is no uncertainty, no iffiness at all. Now, this is no excuse to keep the Lord waiting with turning to him. Let us, let us, let's give it one more try ourselves to do this or that. For the Lord will wait all our life long. 
but nobody knows when that will end. But it does tell us that it is never too late as long as we live. And never should anyone say, I have hesitated to turn to him too long. And for too long I have tried to go through life on my own, not trusting him. And now I can't turn to him anymore. For the Lord is waiting, ready with his answer. And he is waiting for you and for me. And he will wait because of his covenant to which he is faithful. And then in the fourth place, we have seen that comfort or strength follows trust and that this trusting in the Lord is ordered, it is necessary, and that it is never too late, it will always be answered. We will finally see that this trust is enough. In the next part in our reading of the history of two kings, but also in the closing part of Isaiah's prophecy, we can read that the Lord ensured that Hezekiah ensured the Lord that he ensures him that he will save him, and that God so does. And this fulfillment follows swiftly, and it is devastating. That night, that is the night after Hezekiah had turned, sent for Isaiah, cried to the God. Then already, that same night, the angel of the Lord acts. It was not Hezekiah, and not the horses he had no riders for, and it wasn't Egypt, but it was the angel of the Lord. And Sennacherib wakes up the next morning to find 185,000 of his army lying dead. They went to sleep as strong, healthy, dangerous soldiers and never got up again. Imagine the terror of that scene. But then, hadn't it been the same at Jericho? The history they were to be reminded of by the strategic city without walls. The Lord had torn down the walls by himself, the walls the inhabitants fought to protect them. And in all these very real and very challenging situations, trusting the Lord was enough for Joshua and Jericho, for Gideon and his Amalekites, for Hezekiah and his Assyrians, and for us and our challenges. Trusting the Lord was and is enough, and the strength and the fortitude to get through these challenges will follow. Or better, they are already there. The Lord has answered. Now, does this mean that practical measures in addressing problems and challenges and difficulties are inappropriate? That we can, as the Dutch proverb goes, let, let God's water run over God's dikes? No, it does not. Jerusalem had walls, and they were undoubtedly importing, very important in keeping Sennacherib and his yelling Rapsake out. And Nehemiah later, after the exile, urges the Israelites on behalf of the Lord to rebuild them as soon as possible. And he goes to great length in, to accomplish this and to mobilize the people, the church at the time. But if these practicalities are what we rely on to be comfortable, to be with strength, then sooner or later we will be disappointed. Because as the, as the northern kingdom behind the walls of Jericho and Hezekiah behind the walls of Jerusalem, each in their own very different way, found out, in order to be comfortable, to be with strength, the only thing that was really enough is not the walls, but trust. Verse 15, in repentance and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and trust shall be your strength. Well, briefly then and in closing, comfort follows trust. It is ordered, it is necessary, it is always there and it is enough. But what kind of comfort is this? Is this life in a cozy house, lounging on a comfy couch? Are we being promised the proverbial rose garden? Well, our situation, if we trust in the Lord, 
is described as much better than the alternative of trusting anyone or anything other than God. We can read that in verse 22, where it says about the idols that they had been following. Then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images, and you will scatter them as unclean things, and you will say, be gone. These were the pleasant things and the illusions that the people wanted to hear initially in verse 10, Egypt, horses, or whatever devices and schemes we may have in mind, but are being thrown away as an unclean thing. It's a bit of a bland translation. Today it would be like a used tampon. And in the verses 24 and 26, the new situation is being described in terms of rural tranquility and abundance. It is the rest promised to Israel in the Old Testament, so often described in terms of being at peace and prosperous in the promised land. And also the deliverance from the enemy here from Assyria for Hezekiah is described at length in Isaiah's prophecy, the verses 27 to 33. We didn't read them and there is now no time to go and explore all the details here. But yes, rest and deliverance are the finale. But we should also note that these verses are preceded by Isaiah 30, the verses 20 to 21. And although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. So, no rose garden, no lolling about on a cozy comfy couch, Adversity for bread, we could translate, and affliction for water. Problems are always part of daily life. But, but we will know what to do when adversity and affliction come. Because we will be able to face up to the challenges with fortitude and meet with the difficulties with strength. Because, as it says in verse 20b and 21, but your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears shall hear the word behind you saying, this is the walk, this is the way, walk in it. We will know God's word. Teachers can be prophets or it can mean God. Either way, it's God's word. That will guide. The important is the message, the word of God, his guidance, it will not be hidden. It will not be in a corner. We can trust him to be at our side, and at his hand we can walk, and he will guide us through life. And when things look like they get off the rails, he has answered, and, we'll, and we will hear his voice. This is the way. Walk in it. It is as we were singing. How shall the young, and of course also the old, direct their way? What light shall be their perfect guide? Thy word, O Lord, will safely lead, if in its wisdom they confide. Trusting God and his word, we can live with comfort, with strength, with fortitude. Are you cool? Are you comfortable? Are you with strength? If you are, keep trusting and listening. And if you are not, Start listening to the Lord's order and to his promise in the verses 18 to 19. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, that he may have mercy on you. Blessed are all those who wait for him, for the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, and you shall weep no more. He will be gracious to you at the sound of your cry, and when he hears it, he will, he has answered you. And then you will experience that it is true. In repentance and rest is your salvation, and in quietness and trust is your strength. 
Amen. Let us pray.